Hello there, listeners. You are back with the Telegraph Rugby podcast as we look ahead to the return of the Six Nations this weekend. I'm Ben Coles, and for the first time this year, all three of us are in the studio at the same time. How nice. I'm here with Charlie Morgan. Hi, Charlie. Hello, Colsey. And also Charles Richardson. All right, Charles. Good morning, both. Where were you this weekend, fellas? Uh, did you go to any premiership matches? Charles, start with you. Where yeah. were you on Saturday? I was at Welford Road for Leicester v Bath, a, a thumping win for the Tigers, keeping their top four hopes alive. Well, actually putting themselves right back in the in the thick of things for the top four and another another sorry day for for Bath rooted to the bottom of the table, winless in twenty twenty three across all competitions. Sorry to rub it in. No, no, I'm meant to be writing a piece soon about how Bath are getting better, but I'm not sure if I'm entirely <laughs> Commits myself. Mm. They will be. They will be in some. Johan van Graan thinks they are. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's well. You know, and he's the. At least someone at the does. He has to know. Um, yeah. I was at Twickenham for Marcus Smith watch uh, slash the big game slash the excellent faithless set before kickoff, mm-hmm. which was uh, actually quite quite enjoyable. Very very loud. As no in, insomnia. As in seriously, like, no, 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 no <laughs> insomnia. No chance. I'd be fascinated to know. I'm, I'm sure the young people. The young people, the youth. I'm sure the yeah. youth loved it and I enjoyed it. I'd love to know what the older fans at the big game thought about it. Um, Charlie, where were you? you? Did you have any games? About a week myself on a stag oh, do in Brighton. But I've caught up second hand because I'm a uh, proper professional. Thank if you. you were in Brighton this weekend and you saw Charlie sort of lounging about and sort of being generally misbehaved, then please don't email in. I, that doesn't sound like Charlie Moore. No, I, no, it doesn't. I, I, it doesn't. I'm teasing. It's an outrageous claim. Respectful. Um, <laughs> in terms of Charles, tell me a bit more about your game and 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 Leicester. Do they sort of look very settled now, post kind of the Borthwick upheaval and and all that change mm. that happened? Do they look kind of on track? Yeah, they do. Um, th- there's a lot more consistency to them now. That's three wins on the bounce. Uh, the first one of which was against Saracens. Um, yeah, they look like they've turned a corner. It looks like the sort of after the after that upheaval and a slightly tempestuous period there that they um, they've turned a corner. And I think um, on their on their day they're probably a, a top two side in the prem. And I think they've got to be favourites now to, to to secure a top four spot. I know Gloucester and Exeter both have games in hand on them, but also Leicester have to play both Gloucester and Exeter. So I think the the, the, the beauty for Leicester is that it's all still in their hands. They win the rest of their games. They could probably get away with one loss, maybe, to sneak in. Um, and it's theirs, because they've got to play Quinns as well. Um, George Martin, fabulous once again. Extraordinary showing on the back row for the for the umpteenth time this season. Is anything um, changing with him going to lock now? Like two, three starts in a row there. Anything changed? He still looks as prominent in the loose. Yeah, he does. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything has changed in his game, actually. And I think that's it, it, that, that's one of the sort of most impressive things. I think when Ollie Chesham comes back, they'll probably look at playing one of them at six. Um, probably Martin with the way he's been playing, um, but the, the line out doesn't seem to have suffered. They don't they don't steal too much op- opposition ball. Um, but having said that, neither do neither do England. I don't know if that's a sort of I don't, I don't know if that's a, if that's a Borthwick thing. If, I don't know if that's the irony of all ironies that maybe Borthwick doesn't value line out steals. He wants to concentrate on defending them all a little bit more um, because England are the only nation to not have stolen a line out in the Six Nations. Leicester don't compete v- too strongly on the on the opposition ball. They put Liebenberg up at the front a couple of times against Bath, whose line out is beyond mediocre. Um, but that you don't see Martin stealing much ball in the row. But yeah, he was very impressive again. As was Harry Potter on the wing, who of course is also English qualified. My thoughts on. Uh Sort of Smith and Quinns is gonna, are going to feed into our next section, so I'll <clears throat> I'll just tee up what we do have coming up in the rest of the episode, which is a an interview with the Italy captain Michele Lamoro, which Charlie you you did last week. Can you just give us a little teaser? How what was he like and Can did I say, you enjoy uh, it? Uh, it? I'll retain my professionalism again by just saying what a lovely man, oh. a lovely man, very nicely. Um, kind of a confident, confident and comfortable in how Italy are playing, which. Um, you'd expect given how they've gone I know they've lost three but they just look like they're really comfortable in the identity that they've got and Kieran Crowley we crowed about him didn't we after the Six Nations launch saying that actually he felt a duty to entertain and we got into that a little bit with Michele just talking about how the Italian public had maybe become a little bit um, disenfranchised with how Italy Italy were playing stylistically and he said that the last year, although, and we keep saying they had a tricky last year, but if they beat, beat Wales, beat Australia, but around that got pumped by South Africa, lost to Georgia. So um, they, they 
built through a sticky patch themselves. And I know they keep losing, losing, as I've just said, but they are really kind of capturing the imagination with how they're playing. I think that's just as important, really. Um, this weekend, they probably will... What, what do you reckon? Would you, would you bat them to, to turn over Wales, given how both sides have gone? You probably would. Yes. And he, and he, and he yeah. seemed... On and, form, yes. Yeah, he, yeah. Sa- he did say, he did make the point that... Um, yeah, look, well, last time we beat them, they went to South Africa and they won a game in South Africa because they were angry. And I thought that was, that was charming as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah very true. Um, yeah, on form, Italy to win, but ugh, I don't know. I, I don't think I'd put money on it. I just, hope, I just hope they stay true to how they've been playing. I think that would be great. Mm. It's going to be very interesting, that. And it's going to be a very interesting Six Nations weekend all round. I think all three games have got nice little subplots to them. So let's have a little chat first about England against France. Okay, it's the second game on the schedule. It's going to be at Twickenham. Charlie, you and I will both be there. In terms of the big talking point last week was obviously about Marcus Smith. He was released on Tuesday with the message from Steve Balford to Tabai Matson. Matson revealed after on Saturday after the game. Smith was basically asked to go back, boss the game, and sort of make selection very difficult for for this week. Now, he he, he won player in the match... And it wasn't totally undeserved, but there were certainly other candidates from Harlequins who could have won that award. It, it was sort of, it was one of those where you were sat in the press box and you were chatting to other colleagues and, and one of them said, they're just going to give it to Smith because it just fits the narrative perfectly. He'd had a couple of flash moments. He had a, a couple of assists, had a nice sidestep. I'm not sure. I think there were, there were stronger candidates maybe to be given player of the match. Charlie, I know you've watched this back today or, or yesterday. What did you sort of make of the fact that Smith won that award? Was it was it sort of just written in written in the stars, or, or actually were there stronger candidates? Isn't it written in the fact that you get a you get an interview with the player of the match and BT Sport wanted that interview because Smith was a man of the moment, which is fair enough. But cool. the um, the top line from that BT Sport interview, I just said he didn't really give much away as expected. But I think the main thing was he just said, "I just love playing with my mates, and it's really special." And I tried not to. It wasn't. It wasn't at the forefront of my mind. The release. I think that's a, a brief summary. Sorry. Go yeah. On. My, well, my, he's he's really good. I really enjoy interviewing Marcus Smith. He's very honest. Um, he gives you enough to read between the lines. Sometimes after the England Scotland game, I remember speaking to him. I think we played some of the audio on the on the podcast, and he was talking about. I felt myself today in an England shirt for maybe the the first time, and actually him and Farrell. Lest we forget, there are a few obviously a few defensive lapses between them, but they they coordinated quite a lot of nice phase play against Scotland. Um, I think as far as his man of the match, I thought Danny Kerr was excellent. Scrum half Nick David really good at fullback. Um, Andre Esterhazen when Quinns play well, he normally plays well. But those three back rowers, mm-hmm. uh, Jack Kenningham, James Chisholm, and Tom Laude. So Bayern Matson loves Tom Lauder. He mm. always talks about how, under, how underrated he is or playing against his old club in Exeter as well. And just a real dog at the breakdown, break, break sorry, but also really skilled for those little tip-on passes. Jack, Jack Kenningham's a super player. Really streetwise, really, super. really skillful. That, um, he charged down, um, was it Sam Maunder at the base and mm. then actually caught the ricochet himself, which was just outstanding. I think that was his first game back from injury, Matt, since yeah. after as well, which is a pretty impressive yeah, hit the ground return, running. actually. Yeah, yeah hit the ground running. Running. Well, actually, well, actually, we can get into this, but actually the way that Harlequins played didn't have a lot of possession, kicked 35 times. Seeing a lot of people now saying, but can, but can Marcus Smith play? Are England going to let him play the way that he plays for Harlequins? He just made a lot of really good decisions. And, and you know, Quinn's coveted territory... His chip for um, Murley's try was on penalty advantage, so you've got that mitigation. Um, they the second the second sort of long range try that Smith was involved in, and he played the scoring parts to March, and they, it was off a recovered box kick. England do that a bit; they box kick a fair bit. So you know these these are skills that are going to be um, that are going to be transferable to test matches, hopefully. And just I thought that the. I thought that he was tidy. I thought that he was patient. I thought that in those, you know, those long protracted kicking exchanges of which you get quite a few in test matches, obviously, he was he was on the whole pretty good. There was one clearance where he he bumped away Harvey Skinner, I think, and then sort of shinned a shinned a clearance up the field. That those are the sorts of things that can be really damaging against France. So that will be a small moment that mm. Steve Borthwick would have would have noted. Um, and you feel bad nitpicking these really, really tiny moments, don't you? But because of how unprecedented the scrutiny was on this performance, because, and I have to say, the sort of the stir that has come with Marcus Smith being 
released is understandable because of how pre- unprecedented it is. Eddie Jones never released anybody to play for the play for in a club game to um, prove themselves for England. Stuart Lancaster didn't, didn't didn't do that either. So Steve Borthwick is doing this differently, which makes me still think that I would be surprised if it, a lot of this depends on how fit George Ford is. I think, mm-hmm. um, but if he is and he's ready to come back, I, that would still make me surprised if if Smith was in the twenty three. Yeah, me too. I mean, and also just just to touch on your point, how many times have we said and written that in their title winning season Harlequins when everyone was so you know in love with the brand of rugby that they were playing they kicked more than anyone on average kicked loads and, th- and that was a bit of a, a bit of a kind of legacy of, that Paul Gustard left there and yeah. Smith's on the right and I, I remember doing an interview with him and he said yeah that's actually one thing that uh, one thing certainly that I learned a lot from being under Paul Gustard as a coach was mm. kick pressure coveting territory that, and how important that is France in their Grand Slam yesterday, last year when they played arguably the best attacking rugby of any Grand Slam team ever kick more than anyone it, it was fairly deliberate afterwards that Matson described Smith's performance as a masterclass in finding space he was trying to uh, sort of point out that he was you know able to manage the game in that way um, mm. Smith's halfback partner Danny Kerr had a great game probably could have been player of the match and we're just going to hear a bit of audio from him now here's Kerr speaking afterwards right, to have him around the club this week it it's just gives everyone such confidence um, he's, he's an unbelievable player um and I think the tactical display that he showed today was was exceptional. Um, so anyone questioning that he can he do that, he, he definitely can. Um, and he's in a tough position. It's, it's a tough position for him. The captain in that England team is, is the 10, annoyingly, for him. Um, but I think testament to his character, to how he went out there and played today, he could have tried to throw a load of things to, to show her. Special things. He did his special things. Then he also did the basics incredibly well. I don't know how many tackles he made, but he put his body on the line for for the team um, and put us in the right areas. And then the magic bits that he makes look so easy. He just he does anyway. So hopefully you get to see that in an England in a, in a ten shirt uh, soon. But we'll see. I guess. Now, obviously, Care is going to speak highly of Smith, but he also makes some fairly interesting points there. So let's let's think about selection. And I appreciate it's Monday morning when we're recording this so we don't fully know what's going to happen in the next few days. But, Charles, does Marcus Smith start for England this weekend? I would be staggered if he does. And on a, so that's, that's what, in terms of a prediction, I would be staggered if he does. And on a personal level, uh, I don't think he does after having not been with the squad for the past 10 days. I'm not sure his performance quite for Quinn's warranted a sort of complete transplant straight into the straight into the starting team but would I have him on the bench w- without a doubt because I think he can make things happen off the bench uh, well he can make things happen on or, on or off the bench but I think certainly in, in next weekend against France if it is going to be tight France have not been firing on all cylinders they're away from home if it is tight with 65 minutes to go and you need someone to come on and win the game then that sort of Mitchell Smith combo could be you know the, the perfect tempo raiser the perfect halfback partnership to come on and, and, and make something happen um i mean there's obviously it's not beyond the realms of possibility that alex mitchell starts either at the scrum half and and we see jack van portfolio on the bench but i i would stick with owen farrell at, at, at 10 um he's the captain and i would be staggered i think if if smith came in to start charlie what are you thinking i'd be surprised too um however i think um I think that's, that Ollie Lawrence is a better foil for Smith Farrell, if he wants to go back to that. And I know some people sort of um, cringe at that. But I think, yeah, I, I would be surprised, having, having said that um, it depends on George Ford, I would be surprised. Oh, okay. do, do you bring George Ford back after, however, you know, he's had such little rugby, he's at, uh, up to 150 mm-hmm. minutes now, and three, three appearances since that significant injury. However, he has been in. And what we were told previously is by, well, by both Steve Borthwick and, and Kevin Sinfield that every moment on the training field matters. So therefore, why would you leave out a player who's going to be so f- critical to how you beat France? Yeah. And, and I, just, I just couldn't really get my head around the fact that um, Steve Borthwick could take a week's training camp and go, yeah, well, we're working towards France, but actually it kind of, kind of depends on how Marcus goes in this game between two mid-table premiership sides at Twickenham. It just it just it just flies in the yeah, face of what we've heard before. Pre- 
yeah, it's like, like this is how we want to play against France, but next week it's going to change slightly because we're bringing in a different fly off. Mm. That would um, suggest that they're giving up on the Six Nations and that they just purely see the last two games as development games building into the World Cup, which mm. is certainly a, bit, a bit early. Home, it's a bit early game. because, you know, yeah, what happens at Murrayfield on Sunday? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what if they Why? experiment against France and they lose? And then Scotland beat Ireland the next day and they think, huh, if we'd actually just mm. stuck to what we wanted against France, we might actually still be in the mix of the title here. If Scotland win on Sunday, then there are going to be three teams going for the title on the on the, um, on the the final weekend, no matter what happens at Twickenham, because one of the two, the winner, will be in the mix with Scotland and Ireland. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 there's, you've got to have one eye, surely, on, on the World Cup, given the short notice with which Borthwick came in and how little time he's got to develop. But at the same time, he's always said it's all about the here and now, the next game, the next game, the next game. And he surely will not be making any selection decisions that are just solely with the World Cup in mind. I'd be flabbergasted if he did that. There's going to be a time in the future where England are going to have a settled 10 and 12 and 13. And we'll look back on this time and we'll have a laugh. Because we'll remember how this was literally all we spoke about for months and months and months. No, sorry, years. Yeah, 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 trying yeah, trying, yeah, to, work, trying to work out the, the right answer to this combination. I, I'm sort of leaning towards the idea that Mitchell Smith, Lawrence Slade is pretty wild. It would be very loose. Feisty. There'd be lots of mistakes, but it would be fun. I think, Lawrence, I think Lawrence has been really good. Mm. I think even in the in the sort of nitty gritty stuff, defensive breakdown, things like that. Yeah. Not only has he offered that outlet as a carrier, I think he's just just been really tough there. And I think he, I maintain that he's been attacking more as a thirteen with with Slade as twelve. Certainly from set piece, been defending in the twelve channel and swapping the other way. But he's just been really important to how how England have gone. I but think Charlie you mentioned um, Smith Farrell. Do we not think that maybe? that's been resigned to the sort of the waste paper basket as it were I mean because surely if he's going to two playmakers at 10 and 12 he's going to go Ford and Farrell yeah well I, I surely only that's got to be a leading combo yeah so that would be that would be in the case that he doesn't think Ford is absolutely ready to go I would say I think before, do you not think that he'd go one of them at 10 do you think that Smith Farrell is done is, is my point no matter what no, in, is it Ford Farrell at ten twelve? And if Ford's not ready, then it's either Smith or Farrell at ten. I, I don't. I don't think Smith Farrell's done ju- just because I think it can be a good option within a game, Fair enough. Um, and certainly, yeah, that it has given bright sparks in in phase play from set piece from mm. both of them. And I think where it's where it fell down against Scotland was a really bad defensive read from Farrell from the over the top line out prior to Hugh Jones try from mm. to Blutu's kick, and then a, a couple of you know. A couple of big lapses in, in those in those that game against Scotland that kind of um, undermined a lot of the good work that went on. Yeah, um, we could have won is, that game. We said that. Yeah, and and this is the and this is the thing with the Six Nations is you're 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 judging the, on very short preparation preparation time. You're judging these games on, that swing on the smallest margins, and then and then you've won or you're lost and you're out of the Grand Slam and in, in England's case like hanging on to maybe being in, in line for the title just off the back of those really small small moments is tough what I don't like about all the Smith and, and Farrell uh, chat and this idea of Smith coming in is, is the sort of idea that Slade might get dropped because actually I feel like that would be a massive mistake I feel like Slade's been so important for England in the autumn and in the Six Nations and, and actually some of their best attacking play does go through him and I really hope that it's a bit like when we spoke about Lewis Ludlam in the back row I hope that Slade isn't the one who gets squeezed out because they want to try other combinations. I think Slade and Lawrence has been really has worked quite well, and I want to see more of it. I don't mm. want to see that taken away this early. I agree, but also at the back of my head, I can't escape the fact that I think if everyone's fit and firing and a hundred percent, that he wants Ford Farrell, probably with Lawrence mm. outside. Yeah, because I think he could go then. If you look at Ford Farrell, Lawrence at thirteen back three of for the sake of argument Anthony Watson Henry Arundel Freddie Stewart now that, that's that's a very well balanced back line across the board I think Lawrence at 13 gives you what they thought the theory behind having two laggy at 13 outside those Quite. two distributors he's, he's come in and he's now shown himself to be really really explosive as I say really knuckled down in the, in the kind of um, in the dark arts of the breakdown and he's that's where he's playing for Bath, and that's where he's gone well for Bath. Is outside Cameron Redpath, who's a, a similar kind of distributing centre. Yeah. Mm. Um, it got they play. I know this is 
this is how round and round we've gone on this midfield kind of roundabout is that if it was Ford, Farrell, Lawrence against Ireland last time they were in Dublin, if you oh, can God, remember that. that game. And Bundy, Bundy yeah. Aki and Robbie Henshaw uh, bullied that midfield. Um, but yeah, now we come back and I would say Lawrence is a completely rejuvenated figure um, and he and he looks just more comfortable in his own skin, doesn't he? And yeah. it's been actually really nice to see that, you know, the big, big emotional moments, like it, um, when he when he scored a try against Wales, seemed like a release, seems like, seemed like he was, he'd sort of come back to himself after what must have been such a tricky year or so with injuries and what happened with Worcester. So, mm-hmm. yeah, delighted for him. Yeah, so he's the one. He's the one I hope don't, doesn't get edged out, and I don't think he will just because of what he offers. That's good. We've all got our favourites. I mean, who, who's on the fringes of selection for the midfield lads? Are we talking what Stuart Abbott? Like who's who's <laughs> who's sort of who's going to make a late charge? I feel like it's why, you know, nothing <laughs> is Francis. Nothing is certain after twenty nineteen. I mean, could he be back? Is that a third hybrid? Ten twelve? No, of course not. It, um, in, t- in terms of um, any other changes that you we, we'd sort of hint at the scrum half, do you think otherwise? Charlie, I'll come to you first. Do you think with the pack they will stay put? And we were having a, a bit, of, not to pull back the curtain too much, read listeners, but we were having a, a chat in the lobby and you said that you, you quite liked the idea of Laws on the bench again for that impact. Would, would you stick with the same? I think I'd go and change 23, I think. Um, I thought, yeah, I thought Laws came on and, and he added that authority at the end when England could have, well, because of Farrell's misses, was sort of in danger of not getting what they deserved from the game. Um yeah, so I, I I like how that that back row's working, um, and yeah, I, I don't I don't. Jack I was excellent last night for Toulouse. By really, way. off the bench, yeah, what, half an hour or so. Yeah, he had half an hour off the bench. Two match winning. T- Toulouse actually managed to sort of screw it up almost so badly that Jack Willis had to make two match winning turnovers. The first one um, came on the about sixty meters from the from the racing posts. And Toulouse decided that they were going to kick at goal from 60 metres out. It didn't. Get, the clock got beyond 80 minutes and Melvin Jaminet didn't kick the ball long enough for it to go dead. <laughs> oh, I love those. So it was after 80 minutes. Why would you not just kick to touch? I, 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 just, I found it crazy. So then Racing came back at them and who was there again? Jack Willis to win another hey, match winning you, turnover. You were moaning about the Sunday night primetime game in France being rubbish the other week and now yeah. you've had an absolute thriller. So yeah, absolutely. On, you know, I swings mean, and roundabouts. No, it know, is, it is. You know, this balance. Charles, a selection question for you but about France. So there's yes. no there's no Gilanche, there's no Hawass, there's no Antonio. No. So the tight head's going to be... Falatea. Okay. Falatea. And Bordeaux. And that's fine? That's fine. He's uh, explosive in the loose. He's shown that frequently off the bench. He did it in the autumn. He came on and scored a... I'm pretty sure he scored the winning try against um, against South Africa in the autumn, actually, off the bench. Um, don't quote me on that, though. Um, but uh, And then he came on and actually, there's talk of this French scrum and how they're down to their third choice tight head and how they didn't trust Falatea to start instead of, and, and our West was picked to start against Scotland because of his seemingly better scrimmaging capabilities but actually when Falatea came on he made an absolute mess of the Scottish scrum on the first the first put in he he absolutely destroyed Pierre Schumann um first scrum so I, I don't think that's as much of a weakness necessarily um some third as, choice as people think it is. are better than others is, is well, what you're saying yes yeah. quite I mean I think the way that we are going to be writing about this uh, either sort of in the, in the next 48 hours so keep your eyes on the on the website but I think Obviously, I was I was at every French game in the autumn except for Japan, and I've watched I've been at every France game so far in this tournament. The way to stop them is, which will have Kevin Sinfield licking his lips, and it's sort of it's sort of pretty elementary in a way. Is is to stop them getting go forward? Dominant tackles is the way to stop them. Those first five minutes against Scotland, France were devastating. I'm not sure any team in the world could have lived with them with them with their forwards coming around the corner and that being that physical. But also Scotland stepped off. Scotland were not physically dominant in that tackle area and as soon as France get that go forward at that pace their backs are frightening the forwards are frightening as soon as Scotland stopped that towards the end of the first half as soon as Scotland stopped that the, the, the French toys went out completely came out the pram um, they had a, a nice attack off a line out where it just slowed down a little bit Pierre Schumann had a really good jackal where it slowed down possession their ability the ability of Untermach and Dupont without Dante outside them to sort of regenerate momentum and quick ball is n- is not good mm. it, it really isn't good and actually at the end of that attack where Pierre Schumann had jackaled they ended up going back to Untermach who had a really scruffy drop goal attempt for a reason that only he knows it, it was a bad call and it was a terrible strike 
Um, so that's the way. That's the way to stop them. They offload a lot, and when they, they they've offloaded more than anyone in the entire tournament. And once they get going, once they get their because their score their, their forwards are huge, but they're skillful. You look at Bay, Marchand, Villamsa, they're all so skillful. If they get going forward, if they get playing quickly, and they offload any team in the world, anyone is in real trouble. So you have to stop that at source. You have to get up. And to be fair, that's what that's what Ludlam and Willis did so well against Wales and others. You know, well, they really got up and chopped Sinclair too, Dombrand. In fact, all of them. They, 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 Simfield, after some after a sloppy, you, you've got to say sloppy defensive display against Scotland, against Wales. I know Wales are an inferior attacking outfit, but it was highly improved the defensive showing. I thought. Just quickly with Chilanch, with, uh, what are they going to do in terms of replacements? Oh, they'll br- I, I presume they'll bring in Francois Cross, who came off the bench. That the, the other Toulouse, is Toulouse like for like. He he came off the bench against Scotland and actually had a pretty good impact. Chilanch was phenomenal for twenty five minutes. Horrendous look for him. We spoke about that last week. Uh, I presume they'll bring in Francois Cross, but I mean they've got a forty two man squad um, training this week, so it is a little bit more difficult to predict than 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 Borthwick's squad. But presumably, Cross was on the bench. He'll just come straight in because he's a good lineout option too. So what you're saying is we should let you off if it, if it's not Cross in the starting lineup. Yeah, do, please do let me off. Although I, I I'd actually be willing to put more money on Cross starting for France than Italy winning in Rome. Well, that's very good because I needed a segue into the next section and you've just given oh, me one. So let's chat. I read the script. Let's <laughs> chat about the. You've read the script. <laughs> this never happens. Um, <laughs> let's chat about the first game of this coming up this weekend then. Wales going to Rome. One team is going to win, but we'll discuss who it's going to be next. Okay, guys, let's chat about Italy against Wales. Um, sort of an interesting one for Italy because they're coming into this as favourites. Charlie, how do you think. Before we hear from Michele Lamoureux, how do you think Italy are going to handle that tag of being favourites in, in a home game? Do you think they will thrive or do you, or do you think it might hinder them a bit? Well, I'd be really interested to to know what people think after hearing Michele Lamoureux talk about that exact thing because he was kind of sort of a bit worried. I I've, I've sensed that he would prefer to be underdogs for it and he was quick to say he called them he called Wales an unreal team said that they'd gone really well in, in South Africa and it, and that was kind of that felt like it was coming from a sincere place because I think I they're say, quite un- unreal in what way <laughs> well yeah <laughs> but they, they, they kind of I, I what I hope is that Italy continue with uh, continue doing what's what they've done really well which is trying to play with pace trying to play to space um, and they really troubled um, Ireland's Ireland, Ireland were, you know, they were in that fight against mm. uh, against Ireland for a lot of that game, I mean, into, right deep into the second half. Uh, Menachello outstanding. They were bouncing the, the ball away from twenty seven all. Yeah, into the final quarter, weren't they? Yeah, and we, we're not sure. We're still kind of waiting. I think on on Capuazzo to see how how he's going to be, and he's a big catalyst for a lot of things they do well. But Garbizi came back and and was really good. The pack's going really nicely. That back row, I asked uh, Michele what what it's like to be part of that back row is really nicely balanced. You've got a you know, a big bopper in Seb Negri at six. You've got him, really, t- really tight. As Paul, Paul Gustard actually once sort of um, likened Lamaro to to Chris Robshaw, and, and Gustard when he was telling me this was, you, and you know how you know how much I rate Chris Robshaw. Um, and then you've got um, Lorenzo Canone, don't you? Uh, eight, who's who's been a lot of fun. We spoke I mean, spoke to him, spoke about him. Sorry, Dor- last Dor- week. Even with Doris, is he is he the form eight Lorenzo Canone in the tournament? Uh, Dor- yeah. Doris has been different. Well. But he, he's been brilliant, um, Doris. I mean, I thought, that, I thought Canoni was the best number eight on the field in Rome, certainly. Mm. I mean, I know Doris is fabulous and big, you know, we're all a big fan. And right, he, he so. was at six, to be fair. He we was at six. Conan. Well, yeah, there was Canoni at eight, but even, well, even so. Yeah. I, I, I thought that Canoni looked the best of the three mm. on, on the day. Negri gives him so much. I like, I like yeah. how he, he, he balances them out because he's tough. He was so tough in that carry. Yeah. Um, a real game line bully and that gives them that gives them so much because it allows them to play with with pace to space and just this identity that um kieran crowley has instilled he allows that to happen charles will they will they be all right as favorites are you, are you, are you optimistic no i'm a little bit scared actually i oh. think we're, i think we're with with there's so much hope and expectation on them and i just i, I don't i don't want them to crumple under that you know and I, and I think that wales will if anything will feed off that and the Welsh belief will feed off that, and I think this this Italy team are are, are excellent and a, and a complete joy to watch. It's, it, it, it's joyful, but I I, don't, I do think Wales will win on Saturday. I think just to re, to rewind to Crowley at the launch, um, he got asked 
um, what what is a realistic target? And he kind of slipped away from that, didn't he? He was just saying, look, we j- it's just it's just cohesive, effective performances. And oddly enough, they've done that twice with pa- with patches against England. I didn't think they were a complete disaster against against England. Um, certainly in the second half, they put together some nice stuff. But they've done that. And you, you got that feeling speaking to um, Kaylee Lamaro that it, w- it was going. Look, you, I, was so, I was sort of going. Look, you're, you're capturing the imagination here. You're playing some really nice stuff, and he was going. Oh yeah, but you basically we are, saying, we are losing. Come on, come on, mate. Yeah, yeah. Like, this we, is it. This we, is it. We, yeah, but um, yeah, I just I just hope that they um, yeah they continue to progress and they and they stay true to themselves. As I said a couple of times. Well, let's hear your conversation with the Italy captain now. Hi, McKaylee. Welcome to the Telegraph Rugby Podcast. How are you? Hi, everyone. Yeah, no, I'm fine, fine. Just recovering well from a few dead legs in the last few weeks. But no, it's fine. It's fine. It's getting, it's getting better. McKaylee, can you tell us what this week has been like, reviewing the Ireland game and then preparing for Wales? Yeah, obviously, we know like we, we're we not the whole group because some of the players that play abroad in England or France... Um, they mostly used to play with uh, with their own club, so uh, we're not the whole group. So we started a good review of of Ireland, of the Ireland game, and like what we can, something we can do better, and something we can maybe uh, see that can be useful for for the Welsh game as well. So yeah, we started it. About it will be everything done uh, on Monday with the whole group, or on Sunday night with the whole group there. How do you reflect on the tournament so far? Three losses, but so much to be happy about and so much optim- optimism from the outside about the way Italy are playing as well? Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, like I I, I can agree in uh, in a little part. I mean, um, obviously, we are three very tough games. Things, uh, obviously, France and Ireland are first and second of we're ranking. We're ranking so uh, it's obviously not, not easy and... To be to be competing with those teams and to be competitive till the last five minutes, and we had our chance to to win both of them, both of both of these games. So uh, that's that's so so important for us. Uh, the thing that I like to push on with the boys is that like we haven't played at our best rugby. Uh, generally, we've we've created some opportunities and. We didn't. We didn't really. Uh, yeah, took all of them, and that was something that we had to concentrate on. Because obviously, you won't get so many opportunities in a game. It's just eighty minutes, and you're playing the best in the world. So uh, sometimes you have to be hard with with each other to to get the point that yes, we did something great. Obviously, we did. So we played some good rugby. We played some. Uh, we've created so many opportunities, but then the main thing is how you convert those opportunities into points and how you can take the pressure, keep the pressure on the opposite side. And think in these three games, especially like yeah, we just had we just had so many, and most of the times we can we can improve in taking it better and convert it. At the Six Nations launch, I remember yourself and Kieran Crowley talking about a style and identity. Um, of your play, you must feel as though you found that, and there is because there's a real comfort in how you're playing. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think the way the way we started it, it was more focused on the defensive side, because obviously I think you can build. And what we said to each other was that you can build on a on a on the defense in a game. You can build on a strong defense uh, defensive performance. Uh, without it, uh, you can't really try to win the games because if you see you you've conceded a few few tries and you've conceded thirty points against Ireland and to win that game you it, it means you have to score thirty five points and to score thirty five points to a team like Ireland is obviously not that easy. So uh, first of first of all, like we started with a uh, with creating a, a defensive uh, performance. And after that, we focus on more on our attack and our, our identity in attack. And uh, we realized we were actually pretty good in, in, in playing the space, pretty good in, in seeing what was in front of us. Obviously, we have, to, we have to train better and better. 
but uh, we were good with the forwards to put uh, the backs in the best position to to play those spaces and that's something uh, we are really focusing on and we're really working on as a team as a group but especially individually like uh, everyone has his own job everyone has his own uh, thing to do and uh, the better you can do that job, the better you can put the whole team in uh, in the best in the best position to play. As you mentioned, there it's an exciting start. I remember Kieran again saying that there's he felt a duty to entertain and make people fall in love with rugby. You guys play with a lot of ball movement, as you mentioned. You run from deep inside your own half. What goes into your training to allow you to do that? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, like the thing the thing around entertaining is obviously like. Um, in the last few years, I think Italian Italian supporters have has lost a little bit of their emotion for us, and it's 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 so much important for us to have them uh, on on our side in in terms, you know, like uh, it's so important for us to get them back on believing that we can still uh, be a very good team, a very good uh, rugby side. And that's that's obviously something important, but main main point is obviously to win the games, and to do what you can do best to to try to do that. Uh, so uh, to answer uh, second question is obviously uh, so much important that everyone um, can improve his own uh, like skill level in terms of you have like specific skills uh, to uh, to make things go go well. I mean, like a little pass or uh, the way you carry, the way you uh, just present the ball, the way you clean out. And so, yeah, like every every single player has his own uh, like um, range to to perform well and his own uh, range of exercises to to get better on. And the main thing individually is to get the best you can in those little skills so that uh, then the, the rest can be very, very, um, you know, performing well. Yourself, Daniello Ficetti, Marco Riccioni, Nicola Canoni, you're all part of the same under-20 team and you beat Ireland at the Junior World Cup in, in 2017, I believe. Um, do you feel like you're all on a journey together as a young, as a young side? Well, yeah. I mean, um, obviously, like if you have if you have so many young players, you're still uh, creating something. You still have to create something, and that's what we are trying to do with the, our identity. But after that, obviously, we are all on the same page. I mean, we are all very energized. We're all very enthusiastic to to, to be here. But still, uh, we have to understand that there are lots of like a level that you can you can drop from to to perform at, at this at this like in this kind of competition so uh yes we are we are it's me fischetti cannone uh, eduardo Iacchizzi now and marco riccioni we were all on the same under 20 and it's it's awesome to have them here and honestly uh, it's something that creates a lot more uh, of of our of our identity you know we know each other we know how we can get better how we, how we can improve and how you said like it's just uh, so so much to to just have the same um, the same way to to do things you know and that allows us to be on the same page in every single moment uh, still like think yeah now we're starting to to get a little bit more of, of an experience and what's what's important is that we can build on that and for the for the next few years and and maybe something else but you know it's not only about us it's about like letting uh, even like the young players that are coming up to get into an environment that allows them to to perform at their best and to give whatever they can give to the team uh uh, at the best because in the last few years maybe uh, those who just came on maybe uh, didn't find the the right place to to perform and the right place to express themselves so that's that's something so much important for us you mentioned energizing the public in italy do you feel like you're getting there because i can tell you from uh, observers from outside italy are, f- are feeling energized with how you're playing <laughs> Yeah, I think like um, obviously as a, as a culture, us as Italian, we have lots of footballers, lots of lots of sports, and actually, so 
uh, yeah, it's obviously difficult to install like something like uh, a culture, you know, a rugby culture into into our own uh, nationality. But uh, still, I think we can we can say something, you know. You can start communicating with the way we play. And that's something everyone feels, and that's uh, everyone like. Uh, people are just thanking me for for um, letting them like just be happy at the game, just watch a beautiful game and get entertained by what we are doing. So uh, that's obviously not everything because you still have to win games, but uh, it's still like it's it's as as you said before, like we have to believe in something, and sometimes to have those kinds of, um, you know, um, results in a way that uh, tell us that we can, we, we can believe in what we are doing. We can believe that this is going to, this is going to work in the, in the next future. So are people recognizing you in your street from your positive performances? Yeah, honestly, lots of Italian guys and uh, generally, even, even, you know, even my family uh, just, uh, just thanking me for, for yeah for the way we're playing for how much they get uh, uh not not simply entertained but how much they believe we can we can still win the games they can you know if if sometimes the the match goes wrong sometimes you say uh the 50th minutes or 60th minutes then maybe maybe it's gone maybe you don't really believe you can still win it but to take it to till the end it's something that uh, allows all all the fans to to believe that we still can win it, and we on the field are have have, have the same kind of feeling. So uh, that's obviously that's obviously impro- important, and that's cru- that's crucial for us. On this game this weekend against Wales, you won in Cardiff last year. Wales have had a difficult time of it this year. Do you feel as though you guys are favourites for this game? And and if you do, is that a sort of different sensation for you guys in the Six Nations game? Well. Uh, <laughs> that's obviously a hard one uh, I, I do think like Wales is is maybe not in the best in the best position right now uh, compared compared to the last few seasons they've done uh, but I still think they are so an un, un, unreal team honestly uh, they have so many experienced players they have so many class players in in them. And I think they can be very, very dangerous if they if they want to, honestly. And like the way the way they've played in South Africa this summer was just, uh, you know, incredible. Like everyone said, like they won't they won't compete against South Africa, and then they just went there, and it was probably because they were so so angry about our la- our last uh, one against them. Uh, so. I do. I do think it's it's a wonder it's a wonder team, but still a team that can give their best in a in a kind of situation like that. If you see uh, all all that kind of um, um, like what they what they went through last week uh, with the West Rugby Union, obviously it wasn't it wasn't a good good situation for them. But then uh, against England, they've shown so much passion, honestly. They've shown they want to they want to work for each other. They want to uh, really be the one that can just uh, go out and play and yeah, whatever happens happens, you know. And so I, I do think they are they are still a very very good side, honestly. And to beat them, I think we will have a chance to beat them. Uh, it's gonna be the same as as the last three three games, but still. Uh, uh, it's going to be very, very hard and we have to play at our best 100%. Mikaeli, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the championship and enjoy the rest of what must be a really exciting year ahead for you. Thanks so much for, for everything and really enjoyed it. So thanks. Okay, guys. So the only team, the only team, the team who can sort of ruin Italy's hopes of a first win in this Six Nations are Wales. Obviously a mad couple of weeks for Wales and now they have this game. Um, I felt a bit sorry for the two young extra lads who played in that England game and they went to Twickenham and re- had a horror against Harley Quinn as a collective and now they have to go back on Wales duty. I mean, talk about learning the Tough hard month. way. I mean, yeah, that, that, is, that is really brutal. Um, you, Charles, you said you had a feeling Wales would win, so you're going to have to explain why now. Why do you think Wales are going to win in Rome? 
I don't know. I think I think I've just got to. I just I don't know. I've just got a gut feeling. I think that, that backs against the wall. I thought they were improved against England. They they weren't they weren't great in attacking wise, but they at least. I thought they they stood up. There were there were lots of errors. There were lots of mistakes. They lack where well, they were lacking cohesion and clarity. But there was a lot of heart there. I think there was a lot of heart, um, and I think I don't know. I don't know. I've toyed I've toyed with this a lot, and I'm really not sure. But I, I just something is telling me that Wales are going to go. That Italy and Italy are not going to win on Saturday, and I, I'm struggling to I'm struggling to put my finger on why. I don't. I think there is the makings of a good Welsh team in there, and I think if he gets his selection right, I think, I think I would stick with Owen Williams at ten. Cuthbert's out for the championship. I think we, it was announced this morning, and, and Mason Grady looks like the makings of a good player. Lewis Rees Summit looks like he could be the best winger in Europe on his day. Whenever he touches the ball, it, it touches the ball. It's 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 threatening and it's it's dangerous. There's a good front row in there. There's some good young forwards coming through. I think Jack Morgan needs to come back in. I think Tommy Reffel needs to come back in. I think once you get the get the team selection right, I think they've got a chance in what well, more than a chance in Rome. And I think the Italians. I mean, have have they ever been? Have they ever been favourites in a Six Nations match? Oh yeah, ever. absolutely sure they are with the bookies. Well, I don't know, but are we certainly, just they are? Well, I think we Charlie, could, if they're not, I don't care. I think we it's, could say it's anecdotally. Good, it's a good narrative. I've just had a nod from a behind the glass that yes, they are. I think we could say favorites. anecdotally okay. that they're at least fifty-fifty. Mm. Um, and have they ever been Six Nations favourites before? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how they'll handle that. Um, it's going one or two ways, isn't it? It's, they're going to crumble or, or, or they're going to conquer. We, we've seen Wales sort of try, uh, just like try different things each week, haven't they, with selection, tried a bit of Owen Williams against England, tried a bit of Mason Grady, tried a bit of Jack Morgan at number eight. I, I, so I sort of wonder what's coming <laughs> what's coming yeah. this week and whether... Gavin whether, Henson? Whether Gatlin just six. Oh, no, he, he runs a pub now. He's, he does. He's, he's unavailable. <laughs> I wonder if they will just sort of go with their... Uh, how do I describe this? Their safest lineup, if that makes sense. So, so bigger at ten, try and get some old head in that midfield instead of having Hawkins and Grady. Someone sort of steady. They should be Tompkins probably you to start. Really, might. you could you could have Rafael at seven if you wanted, but you'd certainly have Falatau at eight. And and I wonder if they might think about Christian hasn't done loads wrong, but they, whether they'll think about something at six as well. I, I just sort of yeah, I'm really intrigued how Gatlin plays this. Whether he goes with a strong lineup. Or whether he thinks, let's keep trying things because, let's face it, they're not going to actually achieve much in the Six Nations. Charlie, no. what he's got a, he's got a history, Gatland, hasn't he, of sort of picking a side. I remember him. It might have been before the 2015 World Cup. He picked a, picked a team full of kind of players that that the public and pundits were sort of yeah, I'm quite up for seeing them. And it was almost that he went right there you go, and they got pumped by Ireland. I remember that, and then it was sort of like right, well, cool. I don't have to pick these people. <laughs> And uh, so I don't know whether, but I don't know whether if you could, so if you go for an established um, lineup and there is a statement result and an Italy win, then you've really got carte blanche to to totally start again as he has done as he has done previously, or whether this is now where he is, where he's he sort of did it. We we spoke last week, didn't we? He did it. The he had a young young pack against Scotland and then young backs against England, and he sort of mm. whether you just and actually both times those younger players I thought were among their best. So I wonder whether that's that's all he's he's seen enough now, and that's and he's all in on youth, and that's where they that's where he starts from. You do wonder whether they actually need to be beaten in Rome by Italy to sort of for, for everybody to stand to up and take notice of how yeah, yeah a reset rebuild. and for everyone to see how sort of deep the rot is, so that he can go right. Look, this is how bad we are. This is what needs to happen, and then off we go from there. Is it papering over the cracks if they limp to a? A twenty-one twenty victory in Rome. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure. I'd be interested to know from from our Welsh listeners what what they think. I, I both agree with you, but also think that we're already there because I think everybody well, yeah. is, is now. I think the pennies dropped, and I think everyone realises that it's pretty desperate stuff. Um, let's chat about the the big game on Sunday. Big game in the weekend. I'm going to say I'm going to put it out there. Scotland against Ireland. We'll chat about that next. Okay, the big game on Sunday, Scotland against Ireland. We seem to be saying in the Six Nations that every game involving Scotland is the game of the week, and that's not going to change here because Scotland against Ireland is really, really intriguing. Charles, you're going to head up there for it. Mm -hmm. You're going to need every single layer of warm clothing that you have, I think. So I'm excited to see whether you look like Joey from Friends when you try and get in the press box. That's the aim. In, t in terms of what you're excited about... It, is this 
the, Ireland's biggest test in the championship. Is, is this a tricky game in England coming to Dublin next week? Do you think? Gosh, um, may, maybe. I mean, I think the France game was on paper before the championship. So I should say biggest game left. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Sure. Um, oh, well, I suppose that depends of whether England beat France because if Eng- if England beat France on Saturday, then all of a sudden it's all eyes on Dublin, really, isn't it? Because it's it's almost a winner takes all um, in Dublin, and obviously Ireland will go into that as as heavy favourites no matter what happens on Sunday. I think, but it's yeah, it's not going to be easy for them on Sunday. It's really not. I mean, they, they, the good thing is that history, the recent history shows that they've got the they've got the wool on them. Uh, Scotland. I mean, I can't remember when did Scotland last beat them. It's, it's a while ago in now. Two thousand seventeen. Yeah, yeah. So six years ago. Um, uh, and obviously they beat them in the World Cup as well. Um, but so, and they're going for the Grand Slam. You, you wouldn't you wouldn't expect them to slip up. But Scotland, you know, Scotland could arguably should be going for a Grand Slam themselves. They pushed France all the way in Paris. Um, yeah, and it's going to be a cracker. I can't wait. Watched a, watched a clip of one um, kind of bullish Irish podcast last week talking about how. Ireland has sort of squeaked home in these games against Scotland in the last few years or they've not fully played to their best and that actually they're due a bit of a, to give out a bit of a drubbing potentially and when you think about the cavalry coming back I'll, I'll read off the names now because they're in front of me Gary Ringrose Johnny Sexton Tyg Furlong Jamison Gibson Park Robbie Henshaw we're all coming back for this game I mean that's not really fair is it? I mean, there's an absolutely ridiculous cavalry coming back. Charlie, that's going to make um, maybe some interesting selection debates, isn't it? I mean, very pleasant ones, but very interesting ones. Awesome players. Gibson Park is, if you think, well, Furlong, Ringrose and Sexton, we'd see, we've seen already this championship and they've obviously gone well. They're quality players. But Furlong, Gibson Park, Henshaw all would be coming in for the first time and they all have just been central to how Ireland have gone and, and gone about reaching the world number one status. Hen- Henshaw particularly just is a Rolls-Royce of a centre, so versatile, play 12 or 13, um, really nice handler, big boy, um, big tough on both sides of the ball. Um, one thing I would say is that Scotland will take heart, I think, from how Italy uh, troubled Ireland out wide and really pressurise them sort of on the edges with the ball movement because that we know that that's exactly how... Scotland are going to play with Finn Russell there and um, we always talk don't we about Russell's kind of freakish ability to f- to shrug off mistakes and if you know that that interception to Ramos he just doubled down and, and came back came back and, and hauled Scotland within to pretty close pretty close to France so you'd hope that they you know you'd hope that you'd hope that they go about it the same way and if they do and if they take Ireland deep it's going to be great. Charles, uh, you mentioned Jack, Jack Willis in that Toulouse Racing game. Finn Russell unscathed, I'm guessing. Uh, unscathed um, and a bit of the bit of the usual mercurial sort of mercurialness, if you will, from from Finn Russell. Um, missed, kicked, final penalty. Racing going for the win. Kicked a touch, kicked it dead mm. right at the, towards the end of the game, which you know he will, which is which is criminal, and, and he looked absolutely gutted. Um, Scottish supporters will be glad that he got that out of his system. Well, yeah, on he, Sunday he, as opposed to this Sunday. No, quite. I, I mean, he did. L- th- there were again other gorgeous touches, as there always are. But I still think, as as there have been in in the first few games, there have been there have been errors too, and there were again last night. But the, the question is the, the the age old question, I suppose, which I'm not sure if anybody really knows is does the genius outweigh the sort of um, the, the the mistakes? Um, I think. On his day, yes, but I think there is that there is a case and there is a tendency whereby perhaps not. Saw so Ben White was in action yesterday for London Irish against Newcastle as well. So that's both Scottish halfbacks coming through without any injuries, which will please Gregor Townsend no end. This is also a little bit of a World Cup warm up, isn't it? Because they're going to be facing each other mm. down the road. I think they have got an actual warm up game in August, but this is the more high pressure, high stakes one. That, that group is going to be fascinating when we get to the World Cup. I think it's those two in South Africa. In, in terms of in terms of matchups that you like in particular, Scotland's back row have had a really fine tournament and we've spoken so highly of, of Caelan Doris and, and Van der Fleer and, and that contingent. Is, is that potentially, Charlie, where it gets won and lost, do you think, in that kind of area? Yeah, so Watson Watson back, obviously, for, for the last game and obviously got sacrificed, didn't he? Poor guy, yeah. with uh, Gilchrist's red. So 
will be Ryan Sky, you imagine. They've just they're just sort of unheralded grafters. Or a lot of those Scotland pack, I know Charles, you made this you made this point. Russell gets the Russell gets the headlines and, and we're being really impressed by the centre partner partnership, obviously, and and the guys out wide. But it's that ability to mix it, just be really clever around set piece as well. Um, always, always scrap super hard at the breakdown. Um, whether they can kind of get 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 parity, disrupt Ireland, disrupt that that phase play, and that's because we know that's how Ireland love to exert pressure. Um, yeah, it, it's just it's making me smile because it's just the the context of it delivers a little bit as well, doesn't it? As you as you say there, because that if Scotland win that one, we're all of a sudden thinking. Jeez, it's not, and and I know we have we have. I want to say that on this podcast we have said it's still a big ask for Ireland to come come the World Cup, whatever happens, whether or not they win the Grand Slam in the Six Nations. I think that um, getting given the draw, the World Cup draw, I think them getting to a getting past the World Cup quarterfinal is still going to be a really significant achievement for them and significantly difficult to do. But if they lose this one, it all it just changes everything. Someone's written about the ridiculous of early World Cup draws recently, haven't they? Mm, yeah, it might have been me. Um, yeah, well, it is, a, it, is, it is a farce. You know, They should have done it. If the Football World Cup do it six months out, uh, I don't see any reason why the Rugby World Cup can't do that too to avoid this exact scenario whereby you have the number one team in the world, the reigning world champions, and Scotland, who are playing excellent rugby and are in the top five, according to the World Rugby World Rankings, all in the same pool. Whichever People, you know, people have been saying to me, Oh, it's just luck of the draw. It is not luck of the draw. Um, you, it, an unlucky draw is perhaps you're drawn into a pool. If you're Scotland, who are f- the fifth ra- best ranked team in the world, an unlucky draw is being drawn with either the number one team in the world or the reigning world champions, not both. I do think part of it, I do think an early draw changes how you go about a World Cup cycle in totality. And certainly when, I mean, we're used to kind of, we we became used to covering England under Eddie Jones, and and he that was in his head the whole time. Was they had a strong twenty twenty? I know the draws got taken on the two thousand nineteen because of COVID, didn't they? But I'm mm. fairly sure that his twenty twenty was a pared down tactical plan, so they that kept winning, and therefore the the World Cup draw would be favourable. That worked, and then that sort of gave him the out for the next couple of years to to tinker. And obviously, he didn't didn't kind of isn't that sort of a problem in itself though, really? totally yeah, yeah completely but I, that's what i'm saying is that it does it does shape i think how some coaches go about the world cup cycle and it's just funny that that's how england have sort of ended up in a in a situation where they're kind of advantageous yeah. well they're, they're coming up on the rails and they're going to have to kind of rebuild in a very short period of time, even shorter than South Africa did last time. Mm. Final note on Scotland, Hugh Jones is the uh, top try scorer, of course, with three. And I just wanted to double check that because I thought I'd quickly browse the other stats. Finn Russell has the most tries, so n- not a total shock. No. He has the most uh, offloads as well. Not not really that surprising. He's also apparently the top carrier in the Six Nations, which suggests that you shouldn't always believe the stats that you see. Well, Negri number two. Because there many, he is. I'd, li- I'd like to see the difference between top carries and meters made in those carries between Negri and, and well, Russell. Well, quite, because you've got, <laughs> you've got Negri and Kaelin Doris on 41 carries just behind Russell. And I think those carries are going to be slightly different to the mm. carries that Finn Russell's doing. Mm. Right, that wraps up Scotland, Ireland. We're just going to get to a few of your readers' questions now before we wrap up the episode. Okay, let's finish up with some of your readers' questions. Going to kick off with one from James, and and we might lead into a bit of a discussion about something related to that. So James says, is there ever a review of referee or TMO performances? It seems each week they make glaring errors. All teams have been affected, but there never seems to be a demotion or two weeks off for blind behaviour. Well, I mean, we know that referees are reviewed pretty harshly by by George Hughes aren't they blind yeah. behaviour what, what a phrase that is yeah <laughs> yeah I wanted to move on as quickly as I could from it but it sort of links into in terms of sort of missed offences and sort of where areas where maybe um, refereeing could be a bit stricter and a bit more um, have a bit more clarity has been forward passes because there seemed to have been about 80 in the premiership over the weekend in mm. games that took place which weren't necessarily all picked up and left a few people scratching their their heads and Charles Richardson you are one of those people what do you sort of make of the fact that these forward passes aren't quite being picked up the, if anybody but the, 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 the overarching point that I would make here is that I'm not sure that anybody involved in rugby knows what a forward pass is I certainly don't 
I'm 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 going to hazard a guess that um, my two colleagues sitting beside me don't. I don't think the referees do. I don't think the TMOs do. I don't think the coaches do. I don't think the players do. And it's a great big mess. It's it's sort of a, it's on a par with what is a catch in the NFL. If anyone watches NFL, there there seems to be complete. No one knows what a catch is in the NFL or what counts as a catch, and no one knows what forward pass is in rugby. There were two. There were two on Friday night for Bristol. Two passes. Um, there were. There was the, the, the Danny Care offload for say was it Sam Riley's try for Quinns? There was mm. the Tomo Flaherty pass for Sale. Were all I'm sorry, all obviously evidently forward, and they seem because they they don't because they have the technology. They're not willing to give these as on field forward passes because they'll say play on and we'll check it. But then once you're getting into checking it, they will not overturn it unless it is. Well, I don't. They say clear and obvious, and if the evidence is compelling, I, I would argue that the evidence at the weekend was entirely compelling. But if they're saying that the evidence wasn't compelling, then what is a forward pass? Answers on a postcard, because I don't know. And you know, we watch a lot of rugby. They, they talk about the direction of the hands. I don't think that's good enough. I don't think that's a good enough definition. They say if the hands go backwards, the pass has gone backwards. But how do you therefore adjudicate Danny Kerr's round the back offload where his hand is obviously going forward but from a backwards motion? It's all a complete mess. And can someone please sort it out? Because I've about had enough of it. Yeah, Are we just erring on the side of sort of um, benefit the doubt going to the attackers? That's what we're seeing more and more, right? But then they need to come out and say that. Yeah. You know that's fine, and if they want to do that, you know, in the in the famous try of all time, the most famous try of all time, Derek Cornell's pass is five meters forward. Everybody overlooks it, and that's fine because there was no TMO. The referee and the touch judges were probably miles away, couldn't keep up, and it was play on. And if that's that's fine, but if that's how they're going to be, then they have to come out and say that because at the minute. Everything in rugby with TMO and referees is under the microscope, really highly scrutinised. So you can't just say, oh, but we're going to scrutinise everything really, really sort of meticulously except for forward passes. And if they are going to do that, then they need to come out and actually have the bottle to say it. Because at the minute, that, that isn't good enough what happened at the weekend, I don't think. I don't think it's good enough for fans. I don't think it's... That, that Tom O'Flaherty pass was five metres forwards and his hands went forward. Now, I don't know if that's just a TMO error, a referee error or what, but if they they checked that, they said that they checked it and that they were fine with it, and in which case that is a fundamental issue at the heart of the game. And it's not just in the Premiership where this is an issue. It's in the Six Nations too. And James, sorry, I've digressed here, but just to quickly answer your question, there is a really, really, really fastidious review process that goes on with referees after every game, um, with World Rugby and in the Premiership, with Chris White and at Europe with Tony Spreadbury. Um, referees are held to an outrageous level of, an ac- of account and they have access to all kinds of data, including sort of, you know, they all know how many ruck penalties they give, they all know how many scrum penalties they give. That's kept behind closed doors for obvious reasons. They don't want, you know, extra public scrutiny on referees at a time when it's already very, very high. And I think you do see demotions. I don't think you do see yeah. demotions. Yeah, because, I, I mean, Luke, Luke, Luke Pierce, he's, he's barely refereed it. Um, um, an international match. It happens. It? it happens. It's just not announced. Yeah, they, they, they never announce why, it. You just do. You do don't. see them. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that Luke Pierce has been demoted. By the way, I just think that I rate him, and I think we all do very highly among the among the re- international referees in the world. But I can't remember him doing a sort of string of t- like in the 2021 Six Nations. He refereed that France Wales game, and there was another game that he refereed where he was brilliant. He's been brilliant in the Premiership, but I can't remember him refereeing that many sort of high profile games recently. And you, you do you, you do ask that question as to, as to as to where he is and who's making the decisions. I've, I've both listened to every word you've said and had. If you've got any bottle going around in my head, <laughs> yeah, send, <laughs> send them walking. On, honestly, I, I'm being deadly deadly, deadly serious. Yeah. Charles Richardson at telegraph.co.uk if anybody knows what a forward pass is please tell me yeah would be actually some responses would be great for that um and we'll just finish on one more from brockton charlie i'll come to you uh i was who, really hoping i was really looking at that question going please don't because oh, i don't know it's fun. <laughs> yeah. no no but I, I, don't worry we won't leave you on an island we'll, we'll help you out okay please. so the question is very simply who are england's best wingers i'll give you one i think anthony watson is one of them okay. i agree um i think Max Malins is a fantastic rugby player. I think he is. He's ha- he's had a good Six Nations for sure. I'd like to see, um, like to see whether Henry Arundel, as, as Charles actually said earlier, whether Henry, Henry Arundel can offer both what Malins does as far as intuition and picking up 
loads of different touches with obviously the the added um benefit of arundel's pace and power and then the second part to that question uh from brock is do, and do you play daily and underhill once they're fit uh, sam Adeo is fit right he's mm-hmm. playing for, he's, he's playing, playing for bath at the minute and it, and it just seems to have been a casualty of the of the um blend that england's back row have got i think Tragically, Daily. went off with concussion on Saturday, but Daily. against oh, Leicester, yeah, again. But I, 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 he, until then, I'm sorry to say, he was a little bit anonymous. Okay. I think that's a real shame. Yeah, he's a fantastic, yeah. fantastic player, Sam Underhill. But yeah, just a casualty of the strength and depth England have got there. There are a lot of very good players. There. Elliot Daly, I think, would be in the mix. Um, pace that extra, that extra link, and actually, whether you know whether. Uh, whether you like it or not, his his existing chemistry with Owen Farrell it would be a um, would be a point in his favour selection wise. Um, yeah, so I've danced around the. That's danced right. around the I mean, I'll so. accept it. On the Anthony Watson point, I, I said this in the player ratings at England Wales. He is the archetypal Borthwick wing. Really, it, there's no. It's no coincidence that he was signed very quickly for Leicester and that he's been fast tracked straight into the England starting fifteen because he's a lethal ball in hand threat. He has that X factor that international wings sort of require really but he's also phenomenal on the kick chase excellent aerially and very very good defensively and I think that all round package is he's getting close to like first name on the team sheet sort of we, stakes we, there we, we dance around what what is world class and how do you define it and it does it mean best two in your position in the world or you know he's he's certainly one of England's one of one of the closest to that. The, always the available always featured for the Lions, hasn't he? When available, I know Gavin's mm-hmm. always been a big fan. He's always chosen for those big games. Um, that's only one winger, though. So you've cheated me out of an answer. The pair of you. I need. Yeah. So what you're saying, Arundel for the other wing, Charlie, Charles. I think I'd, I'd say Arundel too. I mean, it's, it's it's interesting to note that Ollie Hassel Collins, you know, started mm. the first two games for England. A win and a loss, then was injured for Wales, released to London Irish yesterday, scored a try yesterday. Set up by Tom Pearson. Yeah. Yep, set up by Tom Pearson and has not been recalled, despite the fact that we know that that Steve Borthwick is a fan because the word on the street is that he that, that Steve signed him for Leicester for next season. Um, so I, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that he's an excellent player. But I mean, he, he. I'm absolutely not saying you're wrong. I just find it quite funny that that Aaron is, is the choice because I'd probably pick him as well. But he's he's never started a test, and he's averages no, a, no, t- I would a touching a touching <laughs> test. So like, I mean, I don't disagree. To reiterate, it's I mean, mad, isn't it? Madden's been one of the one of the best players, is he not? Yeah, that yeah. Fair to say he has. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, d- difficult. That's why I didn't want to answer the question. But there you go. Right, that's it for today. Thanks to Charles and Charlie, as always, for your company, and a special thanks to Michele Lamoureux as well for his time. There are no more bye weeks in the Six Nations now. Two back-to-back weeks to finish off the tournament starting this weekend, and we'll be back next Monday to unpack all of the action, as always. In the meantime, you can keep up with the Telegraph's coverage over on the website throughout the week. If you've enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and let us know wherever you're listening to us. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.